Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, rather, it's afternoon already. Afternoon, everyone, and welcome yet to another session of this wonderful leadership workshop uh, brought to you by Golden Key Southern Africa and the Golden Key Mafia King chapter. My name is Obrah Maposta, and I'm from the Golden Key Mafia King chapter, where I'm currently serving as the chapter president. So for this session, uh, we're going to have a conversation, and also we're also going to hear about change management and leading change. And our speaker or guest speaker for change management and leading change is going to be uh, Prof. Balfour, who is the DVC for teaching and learning at the Northwest Uni uh, University. So why change management and leading change? Well, a critical aspect of effective leaders today is the ability to lead change. Indeed, many would argue that the most uh, distinguishing between uh, people we identify as good managers, good leaders, is the ability to bring about change. So that's why we have this session on change management and leading change. Now I'm going to dive into the bio of our remarkable speaker, Prof. Balfour. Prof. Robert J. Balfour is Deputy Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning at Northwest University, South Africa. Until 2017, he was Professor and Dean of Education Sciences also at Northwest University, the Portistream campus to be specific. Having worked previously at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, UKZN as it is known, and as registrar at St. Augustine College of South Africa, Prof. Robert Balfour has held fellowships at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, University of London, Clare Hall, Cambridge University, the Institute Amen. of Education, he teaches courses in applied language studies and specializes in language policy, design, and research. His latest publication, Education in South Africa, Crisis and Change, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. In, in literary cultural studies, his book, Culture, Capital, and Representation, was published by um, Palgrave in 2010 to critical acclaim. Prof. Balfour holds degrees from the University of Rhodes, University of Kosovo Natal, and Cambridge, respectively, and is a published writer, poet, and also an exhibited painter. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prof. Balfour. Prof., over to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Aubrey. I really appreciate the uh, introduction, and thank you, everybody, for making time to attend this, this seminar. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Elmi Castleman and the Golden Key team for creating the opportunity for us to talk together and to reflect a little on aspects in relation of change management and change processes. So that's, that's in essence what I'm going to be talking about today, but I'm going to reference it particularly to personal experience. And of course, I'd be really happy to have uh, questions from our audience, from students and the like. So, Aubrey, is it possible for me to share my screen and, and then we can start with the presentation? Uh, yes, Prof, it would be fine. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much. And then please, if you could keep an, an eye on the time for me, Natasha, so that I don't run over and then we run out of an opportunity to have some questions that would be will do so please just rem remind me when 20 or 25 minutes have passed thanks okay. um so i'm going to share my screen <clears throat> and I, let's see. Oh, hang on um Sorry, I just want to get this to share. Okay, there we go. So, it sh should be coming up. There we go. Okay, please let me know if this this comes up. Can yes, it does. 
it is showing okay. Rob. Yes. Great, great. So I've, um, I'm going to leave it in presentation mode like this because I've realized when I when I put it onto the full slides, it tends to um, to stall the the screen share facility, Natasha. So I hope that's okay. But in any event, no problem. <laughs> um, the talk is entitled "Postcards from the Edge: Courage, Change Management, and Leading Change." Um, and you'll see that I've used this reference to the novel by uh, Carrie Fisher entitled Postcards from the Edge because it's one of the few first uh, novels as well as early films of the 19, I think it was 1980s, to employ a uh, epistolary mode together with a series of internal conversations and stream of consciousness. And I think Leading. Leading entails a critical set of conversations that are both internal and also external, particularly in relation to the processes concerning change. So change as a process, as a set of actions and managing change and leading towards change need an internal kind of dialogue to take place between the leader um, and his or her consciousness, and then also, of course, between the leader and the team or group that is involved in the process. Um, so I think critical to thinking of oneself in terms of leading change is that you need to recognize that there are three concepts that are critical to recognizing change. The one is credibility. Your credibility as a leader is important to the people that you are leading. Is it also really important to yourself, that you believe in yourself, that you are able to justify to yourself, explain to yourself why you lead and also why you expect people to follow. Another aspect is authenticity and courage. Now, authenticity is often confused with credibility. So credibility can be an external factor. For example, you know, your qualifications, your experience, your CV and the like are often the things that you show to the world in terms of establishing your credibility. But authenticity is the internal source. It's the internal source of self that is true to you irrespective of the external credentials, if you like, that are associated with you. And authenticity has a lot to do with a particular value system that you might have. And so in, in many ways, the authentic self is also the ethical self. And that's why courage comes uh, shortly after these two uh, concepts, Cred credibility, authenticity, and courage. And I think leading, um, entails a commitment in the first instance to lead yourself. If you are not clear about uh, your convictions, your motivations, your fears, your uh, self-assessment of your limitations, your strengths, if you're not clear about what it means to lead yourself, then leading change is very difficult because change is, an, uh, by definition, is inherently unstable, it's ambiguous, <clears throat> it is often a source for fear for people, and uh, if it is to become something that leads to new growth, then moving from conviction from an idea to an action entails that you have this authentic self, this internal uh, authenticity and this courage that uh, manifests firstly in self-leadership. There's nothing, nothing worse to experience in the workplace than an insecure leader. A leader has got to be secure within him or herself and able to convey that internal security to a group or a team. So I consider self-leadership uh, uh, students and colleagues as a, as a prerequisite for understanding change management. Thirdly, I think positionality and subjectivity are critical. In other words, ask yourself the question whether you're in student leadership or in organizational leadership of any kind, why should I lead? 
And perhaps even more importantly, why should anybody follow? Why should anyone want to follow me? And then uh, what about those people who should choose not to follow? What would be the reasons that, that people would choose not to want to follow? Because these three questions are really reflexive questions. Um, and quite often leadership is um, confused with assertion or uh, organizational aggression or um, taking very firm stances without necessarily taking into account the people around you. That, that's not leadership. Leadership is not um, taking a stand. Leadership is creating the conditions that enable people to follow, to follow you. And that's why I say there's no point in taking a stand as a leader if no one is prepared to follow. And that means as a leader, you have to be committed to the people around you. Leadership is not about you. It's about the people around you and a commitment to followership. So if you read in the literature about change management and leadership and management, this idea of followership comes up very often. And followership in itself is a form of leadership. So good followers in an organization are active supporters of a leader. And a leader develops good followers as part of the change management process. So an effective leader concerning change is somebody who enables the development of other people so that they too can become change champions. So all of that by way of just a few opening remarks. And I'll talk a little bit about my experience uh, in a short moment. Um, second, second point to make is that leadership is both action and thought, both action and thought. You can be a thought leader in society, a public intellectual, as Jonathan Jansen uh, termed it once. You can become that kind of leader. You can also become a leader, of course, through your actions, but both of them are ethical. Both are ethical. And it was the philosopher who I'm um, particularly fond of Jacques Rancière, who said that the rights of people and the rights of the citizen are those who make them a reality. In other words, when you make your leadership an action, whether it's action or in thought, um, thereafter comes the recognition, thereafter comes the change. Um, so leadership entails change, and change, as I mentioned earlier, entails people, and people are the key to success of a change process. Actions lead to results and results should lead to improved performance. And I think in the, in the business sense or indeed in higher education or in education more generally, this focus on results is absolutely critical in terms of measuring success. And there is very little point for a leader to commit to a set of results unless an organization has bought into that, a set of results as well. So um, in my estimation, I would regard leadership not so much about problem solving, but more about purpose finding. What is the object of our organization? What is the purpose of our organization? How do we get ourselves to that point where we work together to realize that purpose? And here I want to mention transformation because transformation in the South African context is absolutely part of that ethical commitment that Jacques Rancière was talking about by a leader towards the people in the organization. Another aspect that's critical to understand when dealing with change is identity. People in organizations, even if the organizational culture is very strong, people in organizations are, are individuals and they have individual identities. And often the danger in the workplace is that the workplace culture makes it quite difficult for identity, individual identity to become a positive contributor towards the success of an organization. And in this case, I want to draw on the work of a very prominent African philosopher, Kwame Anthony Appiah, who argues that even in, even in contexts where there are protections um, of identity in the form of human rights, the simple right to human uh, dignity in the workplace is not sufficient on its own 
So we often find that in working environments, people who are different, whether it's different in terms of sexuality or class or race or gender, people who are different tend to be excluded if they don't form part of the in-group or the norm, the norm at the at the organization. And that culture in the workplace can therefore really either enhance or undermine the change process. And that's why I've asked this question here, how to harness the energy of difference in the organization is part of leading for change. To ignore difference in a change process is risky because any organization in South Africa, whether it's business, or the public sector, the state is, is on this journey of transformation of the organization. And it's transformation of business, by the way, it's not simply transformation of values. So it's important, I think, to see the change process as a com comprising several parts. A change process means you've got to establish the conditions needed for inclusion and buy in everybody needs to see things come to a point where they share a vision with you as a leader to see things together and in that process it's important not to just simply focus on the need to work together and we all do things in the same way around here at this place but rather recognize that there are differences in the place and that there are particular groups of people with in a place for example women LGBT people, black people, <clears throat> not all part of a change agenda with transformation. So there are three arguments to suggest why this, this, this process of change management and leading for change is not straightforward. It's not straightforward. The first one is that to set up a culture that is inclusive is hard work. Creating an inclusive culture when we come from different communities, different age groups, different genders, different race groups, and so on, to create an inclusive environment is very difficult. Even when we have all this legislation in South Africa, particularly, which uh, focuses on the creation of diverse and inclusive environments, a leader's work to create that environment is very hard work. And unless you create um, that change for inclusion, you're going to find it very difficult to take people along. So I think in South Africa, there's a tendency in, within the workplaces, or, you know, whether it's business and again, or higher education, there's a tendency to associate change with transformation in terms of compliance, for example, to the Employment Equity Act. You know, so, organizations with through their triple B, double E certificates and the like will claim that they are changed or transformed. But compliance is not necessarily change. An inclusive culture, which is my first point here, is difficult to establish, number one, because if you're focusing on compliance alone, changing values and attitudes within the workplace won't simply happen by itself. And there are important things to recognize even within the Employment Equity Act. There are silences in our labor law and constitution about other historical minorities, for example, gay people and the like. And that's why I've said at the outset, inclusion must be a mindful, purposeful exercise. One has to create it um, by identifying differences and through differences, um, being able to form teams that walk, work together towards a particular set of values or ends. Second, second matter in relation to change is that it's risky. It's risky in the workplace to name and identify differences in South Africa. So we all know that men dominate uh, higher paying jobs. We all know that women struggle to get promoted within the corporate sector, even in education and the public sector. And this thing called the boys club and the glass ceiling, those terms refer to forms of hegemony uh, in which the in-groups work together at work to exclude those who don't belong. 
And the problem, students and colleagues, the problem when you kind of join the boys club or you come up against the glass ceiling if you're a woman or another minority group in, sense, in the sense of power within the workplace. The problem is that that, that feeling, that experience um, works to exclude people and it creates a culture within a company, even in very successful companies, a, a winning culture and a losing culture or an insider culture and an outsider culture. So if you look at the, the, the literature on change management, it often speaks about the need for this inclusivity where we are not, we, we break down, we break down and by naming, by naming and identifying, break down those barriers, uh, the old boys club and the glass ceiling and the like, so that people can really feel part of the same workplace and the new work culture that you want to set up. So identifying how difference makes a difference is key to setting up an agenda for transformation change. And that transformation change is, is focused on other people. It is also focused on inclusivity. And it does not mean that you create a new hierarchy of winners and, and losers. It means that you work as a leader to include everybody, everybody in that process. Third thing about change is that institutions don't protect vulnerable groups. You might think that a wheelchair ramp or a lift in a building for disabled people suggests to you that the organization provides for vulnerable groups, but it is the culture of inclusion that protects vulnerable groups. So in, in workplaces, um, we often find that the really marginal people, marginal groups, are those who are on the binaries of kind of power within the organization. And as a change leader, it's important as somebody coming into an organization with a change agenda that you create safe spaces and open dialogue um, with marginalized groups uh, within the workplace. Don't simply assume that because the organization is um, visibly or demonstrably committed to change, that that means it's an inclusive workplace. It does not mean that at all. You have to recreate it. So I, I've drawn on three scholars that I think are, are useful to read that I'd like to recommend to you um, on, this, on this idea of difference and why difference makes a difference and how you can use difference as a means of creating an inclusive environment that supports change as a process in the workplace. And one of them is Morley, who argues that equality in the workplace does not equal um, quantitative change. So um, merely declaring that people are equal without looking at how women are earning less in a workplace than men, without looking at the unequal power relationships is useless. You've got, to, you've got to commit to looking at the structures and the practices within a workplace that create inequality. If you're after an inclusive workplace that can support a change process, then you have got to identify these issues that lead to exclusion and alienation. Then um, Karen Barand, another scholar, um, has argued that Differences within the workplace are made and remade, depending on the relationship between the observer and the observed. And she talks about this uh, in, the, in the context of leadership. She says that leaders are made in the politics of difference. In institutions where, for example, heteronormity, heteronormativity is aligned with patriarchy, then heteronormative culture makes for a, a struggle, a struggle by women, struggle by LGBT people um, for recognition. And that can really undermine change processes. And then locally, more locally to South Africa, one of our own legal scholars, uh, Buerta from 2004, suggests that even when we come to, the, to our courts, for example, contestation between companies and employees, um, Courts, because they are fundamental to the transformation process in our country as well, 
it's reasonable that courts should consider questions of domination and access within organizations. We can talk a bit more about that. So here I come to, on this slide, something about my own experience. And um, in the research that I've done, which I've also published on leading um, as a gay person in South Africa, um, I've realized that, you know, you can't come to an understanding of the politics of difference in an organization by counting people, counting how many people you have with disabilities and on that basis claiming this is inclusive organization or counting how many women you've got and on that basis claiming this is a, a gender equal organization. Uh, the, the complexity to managing change in organizations from the perspective of identity need you to understand people's experience. So student leaders and students, you know, when you commit to change uh, and leading change, particularly in an organization, you have got to commit to understanding people's experience around you. And that's why we often say that leadership isn't simply about talking, it's also about listening, critical listening. Um, so this is just a little bit about autoethnography, which I've used in my work. I'm not going to dwell on it too much because I don't want to take up too much time with it. But if we want to, we can talk about what autoethnography means, why it's concerned with political agency and contestation, and why it um, allows for a refusal of non-disclosure. In other words, a refusal to be invisible. Okay, so, so a little bit about me. I've worked at three organizations, um, very different universities. I won't name them all. Um, <clears throat> but in one of the first institutions that I worked for, um, the transformation agenda was very much a race-focused transformation agenda. So um, sexuality, your sexual identity was part of that transformation agenda by the institution. It was focused on in an explicit way. And because of that was an agreed upon agenda set by the institution, it made it possible for groups that had been marginal to power, who had been excluded historically, black people, women, gay people and the like, to come forward and uh, raise their experiences, share their uh, experiences of the workplace. But it also had the unintended consequence because sometimes that um, experience had the unintended consequence of, of making people who had been used to having power, and I'm not talking about white people exclusively, perhaps I'm talking about white and male people, um, but not exclusively white people, it had the experience of threatening the kind of male or patriarchal hegemony at the institution. So in, in that experience of change, leadership, change management, it was clear to me how older men um, and men in general were threatened sometimes by a strong woman in the workplace, a strong woman leader um, or, a, or, a, or a gay leader. You know, that this was somehow regarded as uh, are strange, you know, why should we follow somebody who is so different from us, you know, why should we do it? Um, and so you must anticipate that when leading change, you disrupt old power relations, and that disruption is a very useful learning activity. Note, note that I haven't said it is a very um, alienating experience, I haven't said that, because as a leader, you should always work to include people, even the people who might initially feel most unsettled by the change that the horizon or the change that they experience. There is a place for everybody in that process. So I was at that institution for a while, and then I moved to another institution with much more kind of values focused. So it was, it was a, an institution which focused on core values you know, honesty in the workplace, punctuality, um, delivery on outcomes, bottom line accountability on the financials and the like. And in that environment, um, as a leader working in that space, um, it was very different. It was a different 
set of values to the institution I'd been at before. And what was so interesting to me was that the, the, the very strong focus on values had the um, consequence of making some people feel more empowered than other people, more empowered, more powerful. Um, so, for example, in an institution that has a, like a, a Christian set of values as its basis, employees who were not Christian or who were um, not only not Christian, but maybe of a different race group and not Christian, felt more vulnerable in that organization in terms of the need to be included. And I think this is very instrumental. So when you're thinking about change and leading for change, always ask yourself, who's going to benefit most? Who's going to be threatened most? And then work actively to create the practices, mechanisms, a culture of inclusion that doesn't lead to alienation. And then a third institution that I work for, um, I'll never forget this experience. We were asked by a leader within the institution. I was an academic at that time, asked to run a workshop on, um, on diversity, sexuality and diversity in the workplace. And when we invited other leaders to this workshop, you know, like managers and, and SRC members and student leaders we invited. And what was so interesting to me was that the people who came were not the leaders. The people who came to the workshop were ordinary administ administrative staff, academic staff and the like. And um, the people that, that we had invited didn't show up. So the workshop was full, but not full with the people that we had hoped would be there to help lead for change at the institution. And this is also an important uh, experience to share with you because a change agenda is not self-evidently one that will make people want to buy in. You really have to work hard to create the buy-in. All right, there are some um, good examples that I'd like to share with you of change leaders in South Africa and beyond. I think Peter Tatchell in the UK is one of the examples of a, of a change leader in society, an LGBT leader in society. Zaki Ahmed, whom you will all have heard about in South Africa, is also an amazing change leader. And then in the corporate environment, uh, a very good book by Lord Brown in the UK called The Glass Closet, I think, is really an excellent account of how good business is inherently appreciative of diversity and inherently appreciative of difference. So this is this whole business of creating inclusive, collaborative teamwork within organizations as part of a change process. Um, I have a series of questions for our students and our participants in terms of your commitment to leadership. Uh, I don't expect that we will answer these questions in this session, but I think they are useful questions to reflect on. Um, why does it remain difficult to think of leadership from an assets-based perspective? In other words, as a leader, why is it hard to think of what you bring as a leader to contribute? In, why is that a difficult thing to do? And then who defines what what is normative leadership in our environment? Is it um, middle-class people, uh, educated people, um, you know, white people, black people? It's a good question to ask who's setting the agenda for change um, because the scholarship shows us that diversity is an important aspect of change, um, but in leadership, it's quite difficult to find it, quite difficult to find diversity. And then if you're a person who identifies as LGBT or black or white or Asian, ask yourself, what difference does my background, my being, my identity as a black person, as an Asian person, as a white person, what difference does that make to my leadership? And what are those differences? Do those differences add value to the organization? Are they positive differences? Do I bring something special in my leadership? 
And then finally, for those of you who do identify as LGBT and the like, how does being transgender, homosexual or lesbian change my leadership and why is that important to understand? I'm coming to the end of my uh, reflections uh, this morning. Um, a few things about the change in organization. We often think that organizations work together inherently because they belong, you know? So uh, you think of Deloitte and Touche, or you think of a big company like McKinsey's, and you think those people work together because they're employed there. But that's not true. Um, creating a teams-based culture is hard work. It means that people have to feel that they belong to that team rather than simply being employed by the organization. So organizations are not teams. Organizations tend to be groups and really effective organizations like Google or for example, uh, you know, any of our, uh, our outstanding local companies, you'll find that there are many effective teams within an organization. So teamwork, creating teams is a good basis for transformational change in an organization rather than simply working with groups. Groups are not teams. Um, and then inclusion uh, is not simply a soft skill. You know, when I talk to our employers at the university, the people who employ our graduates, they, they often say to us as a university, you know, focus on the soft skill development, for example, teamwork, communication, a presentation, professionalization, you know, professionalism in the workplace. Those things tend to make for an effective worker who is not simply uh, there to be paid every month, but who's there to really contribute to an organization's growth. Um, so creating an inclusive environment is not simply a soft skill. It's about fundamental values, right? Like trust, trust. Um, it's about focusing on performance and helping people to succeed, to perform well. It's about focusing on helping to correct mistakes, not simply blaming people for when mistakes happen or things go wrong. It's about praise for when things go well, but it's also a recognition that teamwork rather than individual competition make an organization great. And then finally, I know I've touched on this a bit earlier, but we should never conflate organizational compliance with provisions in labor law to change. That is not change alone. Change in that sense without attitudinal change could be very exclusionary. So what we need to do in organizations is work mostly to change attitudes that have a direct impact on your performance in the workplace. And maybe I should pause at that point, Natasha, and we take a few questions. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Uh, before, I'm going to actually hand over to Abriel um, to handle the Q&A for you. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, it was very informative. I think um, you, you really touched on the foundation of how do we start talking about change. Uh, let me dive straight into the questions that we have under the Q&A section. Um, we've got a question from Nozipo Matebula. Uh, she asks, John Marx Maxwell once said, leaders must be close enough to relate to others, but far enough ahead to motivate them. What's your interpretation of that, especially in student leadership? This is such an important point that's been touched on, or really, it really is. You know, I absolutely agree that effective leadership is leadership that's close to people, that's in touch with people, that is um, dialogic. It's not one way. We, we Sometimes we think that a leader is somebody who must stand out. But actually, the most enabling form of leadership is the, is the leadership that enables the people around you to grow. You know, um, and maybe I should just stop there, but we can talk more about that as well. All right. Um, and then the second question is from um, uh, Lenzo Moepi. Uh, they indicate that on slide eight, uh, Prof, you said refusal to be invisible. Please explain 
in detail. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, thank you for the question. You know, leadership, I think, in must, uh, I, I tried to touch on it at the beginning, you know, that, that thing about being an authentic leader and leading yourself. You've got, to, you've got to be willing to be courageous about you, to stand up and be visible, uh, even if that feels very lonely sometimes. And by standing up to be visible to um, lead a group, you are not in any way suggesting that you're better than the group or that you think that the group is not as good as you are. What you are in fact doing is committing to serve a group. So when we, you know, that's why people, when it's, I, I often love this phrase that people, you know, see they use step up to the plate, you know, and that phrase step up to the plate means be ready to serve the people around you. And that, that needs visibility, right? <clears throat> so if you're feeling vulnerable and, uh, um, uh, invisible and you aspire to leadership, step up to be visible in developing people around you, supporting people around you, enabling people around you. And that doesn't mean to say that you have to become the CEO or the president. You know, wonderful leaders are not always positional leaders. You know, uh, um, and this is why this concept of followership is so important. Um, even in my own work, for example, you know, I follow the lead of our vice chancellor. My work is to enable our vice chancellor to succeed. That's what my support is. That is my support to the leader. I might be a leader in other ways, academically and so on, but in my job, in my work, my day-to-day -day work, is to support the leadership of the institution. You know, and sometimes we think that being a leader is about shining or being in the spotlight. No, not always. Sometimes being a good leader is being the one who enables other people to do well. And that needs you to also be visible, by the way. Um, so good followership is not invisibility. Good fellowship is enabling people to succeed around you. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, Prof. Uh, we have one last question. It's from Nozipo. Uh, she says, we live in a time where people live for the gram. I believe she's referring to Instagram and uh, filters, uh, everything, even their true self. So what can we do as leaders to draw out those authentic experiences in order to impl implement relevant change? Nozipo, it's a critical question and it's a question that challenges us every day because I think leaders are made in a crisis, you know? So quite often when something is going wrong in your life, um, it is a point at which you are growing towards overcoming what has gone wrong. And I think those experiences of change are, are, are part of that internal authenticity. So we sometimes think even from my own schooling, from your schooling, that the leader is the one who must carry, that must carry away the awards, that must have all the trophies, that must have all the, you know, the recognition, but, but, but leadership begins inside you. And it often begins um, in a moment of crisis, you know, where, for example, I just give you one pers very personal example. When I was very young, um, in our household, my parents lost all their money, I'd, you know, lost their jobs, and it was a terrible time. And I realized as a young child, I thought, you know, if I'm going to succeed in life, I'm going to have to work hard for myself. Um, I'm going to have to work hard for myself to help my parents. Um, so, you know, normally as a child, you think, oh, you know, parents must look after me. But I had, I still remember this, Nazipo, this experience of something going very wrong for me as a little child and thinking, uh, I have got to 
do something um, that's unusual. I have got to lead for myself to help this situation. So leaders are made in a crisis. And you also got to ask yourself in that crisis, is it just about you? No, um, a good leader in that crisis will be focused on how do you help the people around you who are also in that crisis might also have had that shame, shame and, and the devastation and alienation and exclusion. And the good leader will be, how do I bring that experience I've had to make for inclusion, welcoming, belonging? Because when people feel that together, it's much easier to work together to motivate people, you know? When people feel alienated and hurt or vulnerable, uh, they're not likely to want to work together. So good leaders use a crisis as equal. They use a crisis to energize and bring people together around them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, uh, we don't have any questions anymore, but I, I do want to also just inquire from my end as well. I'm, I'm a young leader myself, still trying to grow in that space of, of leadership. I just want to find out with respect to uh, managing change, how is it important to be dynamic, to be agile as a leader? Um, because I, I believe, particularly now with, with now having to run teams virtually, we, we were really forced to be really dynamic and it happened in an instant. So how can we work on being dynamic and maybe cultivate that within us as, as young leaders? Thank you for that, Aubrey. So being dynamic, I think, is part of being vulnerable. <laughs> People often think that as a leader, you must have all the answers. You must not make mistakes. You must... You must, be, you must be the one who does things right the first time. But I think a good leader is somebody who can say, actually, Aubriel's contribution was a much better idea than my idea. Nozipo's um, idea uh, was a much better idea than my idea as a leader. And you must have that, um, maybe humility is the, not quite the word. You must have that modesty to say, I can, fail. It's okay. I can fail. I can get up. I can try again. Um, if, if you're the kind of leader that rejects failure, then I don't think you have authenticity because there is no human being, no human being that does not experience failure. So, so dynamism, Aubrey, to talk to your point, how do you stay dynamic is to, I would say, be, be transparent about your vulnerabilities. If something didn't work or is not working, say it's not working. Ask for advice, ask for help. You know, a dynamic leader is somebody who takes people with, not leaves them behind. You know, so the team that works with you, Aubrey, in your student leadership, if they feel that they can change you in a positive way, that they can contribute to your leadership in a positive way, that you want them to give to you that advice, that wisdom, and that so on, they, those people will stick with you. They will follow you because they feel they belong together with you, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Yonita, uh, I, I see you want to uh, have a comment. I think we do have time for you to have a comment. You can Thank go ahead. Thank you so much, Abril. Thank you, Prof. We really loved your presentation. Um, as mm. you were speaking about a dynamic leader, I thought a dynamic leader is someone that can regroup quickly to say that yes. something didn't work, let's try something else. And then I also I felt when you were doing your presentation that if we are leaders and we are inclusive, we are embracing diversity, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, in South Africa, people are very cynical sometimes about diversity and transformation. But I think our world is so different. We are all so different. Um, you know, that to wish it away or not to take it seriously is to really 
um, is to really neglect a very important opportunity in your life to learn from. Very important. And I've always said to our students when I was when I was still teaching, unfortunately, there's not much time now to do it. But when I was teaching, so we always used to say, you know, you learn so much from books, but remember, people are also a world of experience, a whole world of different perspectives, a whole, every person, every person. And be open, open to, to listen, to learn, to enjoy, to appreciate difference, to appreciate difference. You know, and that's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, unfortunately, our history and even the way we live makes it difficult, you know. Thanks. Jenny. Thank you very much, Prof. Great. Thank you uh, I, I think this was, this was uh, a great presentation. Um, be sure to tune in for more of uh, the sessions that we have uh, coming up. Uh, the next session starts at two o'clock. Um, so please do tune in. We, we did share all the links. You can also go on our social media platform uh, to do um, log in. I think it's also worth mentioning that um, Prof Balfour is also a Golden Key member. So yeah, uh, yes, GK. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much once again, Prof. We really appreciate it uh, for you uh, fitting us in in your busy schedule. Also, we'd like to ch thank um, Golden Key Southern Africa for allowing us to have this platform to chat about leadership. I think it's important for us to really unpack and understand what true leadership is because uh, I, we love throwing the phrase that young people are the leaders for tomorrow, but even in our current spaces right now, we are leading, we are leaders. And sometimes we throw ourselves in the deep end without fully understanding all this concept about leadership, vulnerability, uh, diversity, self-mastery. So thank you so much for allowing us to have this conversation and learn about leadership. We truly appreciate it. Uh, from my end, again, I'd like to say thank you so much. And of course, on behalf of the Golden Key Mafikan chapter, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you in the next session. Thanks, Aurel. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.